thing. Glad you're joining us today. Uh, we have the, the third part of the dream or vision I had. Uh, <clears throat> I want to share that with you, uh, but I'd like to share some stories. Um, so many of my stories are spiritual warfare stories, and these are, are not in, in that sense. Uh, I remembered and I wrote down two of them and the third one I don't remember. So I'm praying that as I'm telling you the first two stories uh, to illustrate uh, the, our prayer thing today, that God will bring it to mind. And if not, well, uh, then just tear the check in half and send half the check to us because you didn't get the whole message, okay? Well, uh, <clears throat> I learned a lot of things in counseling. Uh, the first church I pastored, uh, and I've talked to you about that, that was in the, the, the mountain church with the cowboys and loggers. And there was a logger in that church. He never came to our church. And his wife, I guess, used to, but I never had met her. And uh, they were uh, Norwegian from Norway. And uh, when I heard that she was bedridden, I would go and share part of the message I shared at church and would pray with her. And she would say, um, would it be okay if I prayed in Norwegian? Now, I wasn't sure that God knew Norwegian. <laughs> but I'm Norwegian, and it's part of my I'm sort of a Heinz variety guy, and one of, one of the parts of me is Norwegian. And I said, yes, go ahead. And she would really cry out to God in Norwegian from her bed because she was bedridden. The thing that I learned from her and then I learned later on as I traveled to parts of the world that people can be bilingual, but when they want to share something from the heart, they want to share it in their heart language, not English. Uh, and that was very, very helpful to me because a lot of people prayed in different languages. I had no idea what they were saying. Uh, if they sounded mad, I would duck while they were praying. <laughs> and if they weren't, I wouldn't duck. Uh, so I, I learned that there's prayer from the heart really what counts and what really matters. And I have uh, two prayer stories I want to share with you uh, today. Uh, we uh, had to go. I was w with the mission at this time, and uh, we needed to go to Africa and uh, into uh, northern, um, western Africa. And... Um, they decided to, instead of us going to all these different African countries where our mission was working, we would ask for uh, people from those countries to come to Ghana, Africa. And there we could speak to all these different people. The, um, I was to go and to provide, I was teaching spiritual warfare uh, and also to counsel. And I knew that some of these people were from French speaking uh, countries. They could speak English, but French was really their heart language. So I, uh, I, I, I said, you know, to really be able to minister effectively, uh, we have a, a missionary here in Africa who uh, was speaking French uh, and, and worked in French French Africa, parts of Africa that were French. And so they had her come and meet us in Ghana, Africa. And I had known her uh, from the mission and times she'd be there and so on. And she told me a wonderful story, um, an experience she had. And I'd like to share this with you because she was going to translate when 
people are counseling and they have to share something that's hard or difficult, sometimes the English words escape them. They, they, they don't know how to say it, but they can say it in the heart language. And so she was a wonderful help. Well, she um, was single and there was a gal with Christian Missionary Alliance mission that was single and they decided when both of them spoke French very well, they decided to team these two girls up and they would go to these various churches that didn't have a women's ministry and they would come in and teach women how to minister and have ministry and also how to have a ministry to the children and how to lead children to Christ and that kind of thing. And it was very, very successful. And so when we met, she said, Jim, I, I'd really like to tell you a story. She said, this just happened to me. This was right after Easter um, when we were meeting there in Africa. And she said, I, I'd like to tell you uh, this experience. No one has heard it yet. But let me tell you, she said, she and her friend had a ministry in church and it was very successful. And one of the deaconesses kind of looked out for them. And, uh, and in this part of Africa, and a lot of Africa, I'm sure, but in this part, definitely, one of the ways you show that you like someone or concern or that kind of thing was to cook, cook something and bring it to them. And so this lady would cook up something. And so when the girls came back from ministering, uh, she would bring it over to them and did this for for over a year. Uh, she cooked periodically for them. Well, she got a, a, a letter from this woman uh, at Easter time because they had moved on to another church in doing what they were doing. And this lady asked their forgiveness because she was poisoning their food. She didn't like them and she was trying to kill them. And so she would put poison in the food and she knew it was enough poison to kill them. The gals would eat this poison food and they were okay. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't fall over. So the next time she did, she upped the poison. And uh, she looked at me and says, can you imagine? We're, we were eating poison and we never even got sick. Um, and she said, you know, it reminds me of the ending of, uh, I think it's Luke that has the two endings, where it says they shall drink poison and it will not affect them. And so she had been, God had protected her and her her partner, and this woman had come to Christ. Here she was on staff at the church or as a deaconess, and she had never trusted Christ. And she didn't like these girls because women in the church were looking to them because they were teaching them and so on. And so she tried to get rid of them. Uh, and she said, can you believe that? We never prayed. We never asked God to protect us from being killed. And yet God protected us. Uh, and that's, a, a, to me, a wonderful prayer of God's protection. You know, we can pray. They were committed to the Lord. They had a prayer life. They were being used of God. And yet uh, when it came to touching them, God protected them, even though they didn't pray about not being poisoned. Uh, so prayer is, is a wonderful and it's a wonderful, powerful thing. So here were women protected who were walking with God and uh, they were protected and didn't know it. What about you? You know, are there times maybe you would have, uh, you were late and the reason you were late was there would have been something terrible that would have happened on the way driving or something and God protected you. It's, it's a wonderful thing to walk with God 
and to be under his umbrella of protection. The next story I want to tell you is <clears throat> even more unique uh, when it comes to God and prayer. Dr. Helen Rosavira, uh, I have books on her life and I've read it. I've met um, a family who were very, very close friends with her. Uh, I've, I've never met Helen Rosavira. I've heard her. I've, I've had videos uh, at some point in time of her speaking. But she was a medical doctor in Belgian Congo. Uh, and she was out, way out in the sticks. Um, and she was ministering. Um, she was able to preach the gospel. She performed surgeries. Uh, she took care of the sick. Uh, she did a, a lot at this particular place where she was at. And uh, she also um, ministered to children. So she just was working all the time. Well, Helen Rosavera was performing a birth. And the mother um, hadn't come to full term. And in the delivery of the baby, the mother died. This African mother died. And they had this preemie baby. And so uh, it was very important. And of course, this is out with no electricity, uh, no modern of anything. And Helen, Dr. Rosavira asked one of the ladies that works with her um, to bring them a hot water bottle. And there was just one. And she went to fill it with water, but it was so old, it just ruptured. And so she's going, oh, what are we going to do? This baby's got to be kept warm. It'll die. It will not survive. So she asked this woman if she would sleep with the baby. And then they would try to figure out what to do the next day. So the next, the woman did sleep. The baby survived. This little tiny, tiny preemie survived. And uh, this woman had also... Uh, another daughter that was, I think, th about three years old. Well, anyway, what's interesting is Helen Rosavira in the morning gathered all the children that were that they were ministering to and said, you know, we really need to pray because if we don't get uh, a hot water bottle uh, or something similar, uh, this baby's not going to survive. And so the children were praying, but there was a 10-year-old girl that um, uh, really believed God and believed that God could answer prayer. So she prayed, and she told God about this baby, and she said, we need a hot water bottle, and we need one today. Because if you send it tomorrow, the baby will die. We've got to have this hot water bottle today. And by the way, God, she has a sister. This baby has a sister. And it would be really nice if you would also include a doll. So the, this little girl would know that you love her. And so she said, amen. Well, Dr. Rosalvera heard that. And you know, when kids pray like that, you're going, oh, what can we do? The little girl had a little more faith than Rosavera. She had been there over four years and had never got a package from her home country. I believe Rosa Vera was either an American. I don't think she was an American. I believe she was English. But she never got ever had got a package in four years from anybody. And at noon, a box was delivered. And here was this box. And, of course, the kids all gather around. And they cut the, the, the ropes around it, this box, and opened it up and started going through it. And in that box, there was a hot water bottle. Now, who would send a hot water bottle to the heart of Africa in the, on the equator? I mean, it's so hot, you wouldn't think of it. And the hot water bottle... 
And then the little girl said, look some more, look some more. This 10 year old and they found a doll that they could give. Now, this is interesting. This box to get there, it took five months for that box to get to where she was in Africa. Now, what is that saying? And this, I think, can blow your mind a little bit uh, or expand it, uh, being um, more um, educated. Uh, we want to expand your mind. And Isaiah, think about this. Isaiah 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call or before they pray, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. God knew that these girls were being poisoned and he protected them. God knew that there was going to be this preemie baby and they were going to need a hot water bottle. And he knew that they ought to put a doll in for this little girl. So this little African girl really would believe that God answers prayer. So that package was put together five months before they prayed about it. Now, I'm sorry, but that blows my mind. God answered a prayer before I knew I had a need and answered it specifically, not just generally. Oh, they got a box. Now, because they had normal, you know, bandages and, you know, pills and things like that in there. But who said, let's put a doll in there? <laughs> Helen Rosevere is probably not playing with dolls anymore. She's a medical doctor. <laughs> you know, it's just when you think of that and, and that verse, um, that's a good verse for you to think about. It shall come to pass before you pray, I will answer. And while you're at speaking, I will hear. So God can provide for our needs before we even know we have needs. So when we pray, we get an answer to prayer. But the answer, uh, there was a chorus we used to sing. I believe the answer's on the way. I don't know if you ever sang that. But we used to sing that uh, in church. I believe the answer's on the way. You know, <clears throat> and see, when you pray, you need to what? believe the answer's on the way. And what I don't know, what I need to pray for, I'm trusting God is going to take care of me. Uh, whether, you know, whatever country I'm in or whatever I'm going through, God will take care of me. Okay, now, what we are, we talked in our thing about prayer and about the dream I had. And there were parts, different parts uh, to that dream or, or vision, because I don't remember because it was it, it lasted for hours during the night. And we've covered two aspects of it. The first was that we were to use our website to call people to pray for hurting people. And, um, and of course, that keeps going on, even though we moved on to number two calling people, uh, pray for those out there who are hurting. The second prayer uh, that we had, and we, we added to that, but we added, you know, um, situations that come up that you hear, like going back to school, and it's very, very difficult for the teachers uh, to follow all the rules and regulations right now. And, uh, and the teaching is, is much more work for them and so on. And so, you know, praying about things that pop up now, uh, the teachers, the struggles, 
uh, and all of that. But the third one um, is an important one. And I, I really prayed about this because this is not a, an easy thing to talk about uh, when you get involved in politics. Um, I'm not a, a politician, but we need to learn about politics in a way and prayer. And so 1 Timothy chapter 2 is a really good verse because we're to pray about uh, this, we're to pray, uh, I mean, pray for those. Here he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications and prayers and intercession and the giving of thanks be made for all men. And so there's the things what, what can be involved in my praying for others. Well, thanks, you know, intercessions, supplications, um, praying for their needs, that kind of thing for all men. And then he adds, for kings. Well, who are kings? Well, he adds, and for all they're in authority. Because you may not have a king. Or you may have someone who is a leader that thinks he's a king. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whoever are the leaders, he says, pray for them. for That we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we're told here to pray for those that are in authority. And it's right now, I know we have people in other countries that listen to this, but in our country right now, um, if you are in politics at all, somebody is against you. <laughs> and it, it's, it's just fracturing uh, our people. And so as believers, God says, pray for them. Pray for all those in authority. It's so easy to run people down. Uh, but as a Christian, you're to run them up. And let that be our, our, our word for the week. <laughs> Don't run them down. Run them up. Um, if, if they're as bad as what you say they are, they really need your prayers. <laughs> pray for them. Uh, pray for those in leadership, the people that can change the course of a nation. They need our prayers. And, and talking to people about them, that you don't like them or whatever, or you should like them or all of that, that's not the answer. God did not tell us that. And it, it just breaks my heart to see even um, families divided on the issue of politics. And we're talking about Christian families divided. Well, I like this person. No, I don't. I like this one. And, and all that stuff going on. And we need to be praying for them because God puts them up and God puts them down. Now, I need to do my part. I need to... Uh, vote or whatever you do in your country for the leadership. You need to follow uh, what your heart is telling you to do, but then leave it in God's hands and then pray. If you look at the early church and you look at the history, what was it like to live in Corinth? What was it like to live at Ephesus, which was the most evil, one of the most evil places uh, in the world to live? And also Corinth. Corinth was really evil, wicked, terrible place where the Corinthians were. Um, you know, and the church thrived. The church grew. And yet the government was anti-God, anti-Christian, uh, occultic, demonic, horrible, horrible. But the Christians what? They knew the key. They did what God said. God said, pray for those that are in authority. Uh, and God can bring a revival. God can bring uh, 
a change. Uh, so, beloved, don't let the political atmosphere destroy your walk with the Lord, destroy your family relationships, but let it be a motivation to pray. You know, as Helen Rosavera and those kids pray for the little preemie baby. They had a preemie baby. What could they do? Well, they could have argued about it, you know, and all of that. But no, let's pray. Let's pray and tell God about our problem and let God handle it. Um, if we have to go through persecution, if you're a believer, I'm too old to go through persecution. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not praying for that. But I don't know. I know the church did. And it purified the church. And the church became strong. And the key, it was a praying church. That prayer was so vital in the church because of the situation around them. So let's go back and look at our luncheon prayer time. That pray, you know for what's happening around you, what you see. Pray for those that are really being hurt, and it's going to get worse if what the information out there is saying, it, 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 there's not a let up in sight financially and that kind of thing for people. Um, and so we need to be on our knees. Uh, don't expect, I mean, the only time a non-christian person prays is often is is when all everything is so bad and there's you know it's you know so let's pray this is, is it that bad <laughs> is, it, is it that terrible we got to pray it must be really awful well we need to be praying not only when it's really awful we just need to be talking to god so use your lunch time to pray for you know people you know but also pray about the election that's coming up in our country. Now, where you are, there may not be an election, but pray for those in authority. That's what God says. Mm -hmm. Pray for them. Uh, pray that there are people in authority that have come to Christ uh, because people were praying. And so remember, before they call, I will answer. And that's such a wonderful verse to think that, I'm going to have a need, and yet God pre-knew it. Now, you said, explain it to me. I can't. Uh, how could Helen Rosavera explain the box that was sent and had just exactly, specifically what they prayed in it that was packed five months before? Uh, I can't. Father, I pray that we might just see you as the God of, of all time, the God who knows. Right now, whoever's watching, you know where they are. You know what they go through. Lord, I think of some of the friends that I know that right now are going through some very, very deep waters. Um, surgery, um, which will not be a real solution, seems to be the only option. And uh, Lord, <clears throat> people that are hurting, they're all around us. May we pray for them, may, may we see if we are able, can we do something to help them? Um, and so, you know, remember the Lord says the next time you want to run somebody down the lord says that's not biblical this you're to run them up you're to pray for them and the the more you see that they need prayer the more prayer you ought to give give to them you know and when you see others that are trying to stand against the tide um and, and the things that are happening that don't make sense. There are many places 
that need our prayer and need God's protection. Uh, there are certain places in the country where people are moving away because they do not feel safe living anymore with what's going on. So, Lord, there's a lot of turmoil going on in our nation. And uh, we're coming up to an election. And, Father, we're praying right now that the person uh, of your choice, that you would lay that person on our hearts and we would cast our ballot for them. And so we're committed to you, Father. We're committed, our church, our friends, and other Christian believers, we commit them into your hands during these difficult times. And so thank you, Father, for the wonderful privilege of going into your presence and to pray. And Lord, help us to learn to let go of our prayer requests. Give us the, the inner satisfaction, the inner joy that you've heard and you have it. it. It's what they used to call, Father, praying through. I pray to, I know that you've heard me and I can let go of it and trust you to bring about the right answer. So we thank you, Father, that we can take our requests and lay them at your feet and that you're able to answer them according to your will, not necessarily ours. In Jesus' name, amen.